Well, good morning, you guys. My wife and I uh, came up from Bend yesterday. Uh, my wife, Andrea, is here with me. Uh, my name is Ryan Couch. I actually grew up here uh, in Olympia, kind of out South Bay area. I went to North Thurston High School, class of 94. Any, any Thurston students? Really? Wow. So we went to school together? Wow. Um, what do you know? But uh, yeah, my wife and I, we, uh, we live in Bend. We have a son that still lives at home. He's a junior in high school. Our daughter's a freshman at a small college in Eugene, uh, Oregon called Gutenberg. And um, so yeah, that's kind of our story. Uh, Andrea and I own and operate a produce and Christmas tree business in Bend. And up until 2012, I was a full-time pastor and church planner. Um, without going into too many details, uh, it was after going through some very difficult times in ministry that I began to rethink much of what I want to talk with you guys about this morning. Uh, this morning I want to look at Romans 7 uh, and how that passage informs the Christian life. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there, Romans chapter 7. We're going to take note of three things in this passage. As Christians, we are a dual-natured soul, uh, what's called the simul, the simultaneity of sinner and saint. Uh, that's the first thing. As Christians, we're a dual-natured soul. A second thing we're going to see is that as Christians, we are both free from the law and under its curse. And the third thing is, as Christians, our growth is not about our movement toward God, but His movement toward us, uh, what, me, what might be called a death and life paradigm. So let's read Romans 7, verses 1 to 6, and then we're going to skip down to verse 18 through 25. So Romans 7, 1 to 6. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And then skip down to verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, 
and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. The first thing I want us to take note of is that as Christians we are a dual-natured soul. Uh, Aristotle taught that the basis for logic was the law that contradictory things cannot in one th cannot be one thing at the same time. The principle of non-contradiction, it's called. Yet the Bible tells us something very different. It tells us that the Christian is two separate people at the same time. He is both simultaneously dead and alive. He is both a sinner and a saint. In fact, much of Christian theology is built upon these seeming paradoxes, these important distinctions. In the same way that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, so the Christian is 100% sinner and 100% saint. Two separate and distinct natures. This is what Paul is describing in Galatians chapter 5. When he talks about the works of the flesh, what the sin nature produces, and the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the new nature in Christ. These two natures, Paul says, are at war with one another. Which is exactly why Christians can be so impossible uh, to, to deal with at times. Uh, we are by definition schizophrenic, being pulled in two different directions simultaneously. But herein God speaks two separate words to the Christian. He speaks His word of law to our sin nature to condemn and kill and His Word of Gospel to comfort and set us free. It's in these two natures that the message of God's Word is rightly understood. His law in as much as we are sinners. His Gospel in as much as we are saints. And this gets to the idea of sanctification or what it means to, to be holy or to live uh, in Christian maturity, um, what sometimes people call Christian growth. Outside of this idea that the Christian is simultaneously sinner and saint, um, outside of this recognition and affirmation of, the, of what's called the simile, we wrongly believe that the sin nature is something that we can change that we can transform, that we can improve upon. But is this what the Bible teaches? Does the Bible direct us and teach us to look for transformation or growth? Or does the Bible compel us toward death? Let me give you an illustration. Uh, growing up, uh, here in Olympia, in fact. My dad used to bring home project cars and boats and whatever he could get his hands on, really. It didn't make a whole lot of difference what it was. If, if he could fix it, then he would bring it home. Um, and they would typically, these projects, would sit in the driveway for who knows how long, months, years sometimes, before he did anything with them. Uh, because he'd have several projects going on at once and he was constantly working on something out in the shop um, which you know as a kid I just thought you know he's a really hard worker and then as I now I'm older and an adult I realized he was just trying to escape life and the difficulty of raising kids right uh, but with lots of hard work and determination he could, uh, he could turn an old pile of junk into a beautiful, well-running machine. 
Um, and many view the Christian life similarly. It's a project where we partner with God to take our old, junky, clunky life, the old man, and with discipline, what we might call discipleship, determination, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can make this old junker into a well-oiled machine that is used by God for His glory, for a witness to the world, amazing growth and maturity. But here's the problem. Sanctification is not a repair job. God is after something new. He creates from nothing. Ex nihilo. By His Word, as we see from the very beginning, that God created with the Word of His mouth, and it was so. This is how God always creates, and this is how He recreates us and fashions us into His image, by His Word. It's purely by the work of Christ. There's nothing to add. But even when you try to add to it, you can't screw it up. The Christian life as a project is a very prevalent idea, however. God and I are tinkering on this old car together, progressively making it better, taking it out for a spin. Then it usually breaks down, right? And together we push it home or tow it home. And, and He assures me that you know, I'm forgiven. He is the God of second chances after all. The problem with this view is that it leads to only one of two places. One, pride. I'm actually pulling this off. Two, despair. I'm not getting any better. This car, my life, is falling apart. And while it seems that everyone else is getting fixed up, I'm not making any progress. Both of these natural positions cause you to look within and toward those around you for comparison instead of to Christ and to His promises. By fo focusing on fixing up the old car, the old man, the old you, we miss out on the brand new car that's been sitting in the driveway the whole time. He's given us the keys. But that old car, it's hard to give up on it. Because we'd rather work on ourselves than give up on ourselves. We'd rather climb a ladder of upward progress than descend into death. The good news is that despite all of our efforts to add to the finished work of Christ, we can never undermine it or thwart it. It accomplishes what it sets forth. We, we actually don't work at becoming holy. We are already declared to be so. Uh, the Christian is not progressively getting better, starting at 50% sinner and 50% saint, and moving steadily toward more saint than sinner. That's how we think about every other sort of endeavor in our life, right? But the more time and effort we put in, the better we get. But the Christian life doesn't work that way. The Christian is 100% sinner in himself and always will be, and 100% saint in Christ outside of himself. Romans 7 and the, the way that Paul describes the Christian life there, and Romans 8, which you're probably familiar with, which talks about the abundant Christian life and the victory that we have, they're, they're not a sequence. It's not Paul describing moving from Romans 7 into Romans 8. They're, they're, they're experiences that happen simultaneously. The Christian life looks a lot like the complexity Paul describes here. 
a person who knows the good they want to do, but often fails to do it. Has that been your experience? It certainly has been mine. A person who knows the sin they want to avoid, but routinely finds themselves doing it. So that's the first thing that I want you to notice this morning, is that the Christian is a dual-natured soul. Sinner and saint. Both in need of the law and the gospel. Second thing is that as Christians, we are both free from the law and under its curse. We are both the dead husband and the free wife that Paul describes here. When the law is heard correctly, it accuses of sin. Here it accuses the old dead Adam or Eve but the Christian can also rightly say, I am free of the law's accusation. I am dead to sin in the law. My husband, the law, is dead. And I have been given a new groom, one who does not condemn but has set me free. Christians are both the dead husband and the free wife in this sense. The problem is that the old person, the dead husband, is the one you feel and see and experience and know. The new, the new groom, the freedom that you have as a new person in Christ, it's only heard and not seen. It's received by faith. And it exists outside of you. And it comes to you on the lips of another. And you have to trust that those promises are true. Whereas the old man and the accusation of the law is what we feel and see and experience in an existential way. It's what we're most acquainted with. The new man and the righteousness that comes with him are really foreign to us what theologians call alien. They come to us from outside of ourselves, from Christ as a gift, and it's not by sight, it's not really by experience, it's by faith. So let me illustrate this, this idea that I'm trying to get across with a parable uh, that I wrote that I hope will kind of bring this um, some clarity. Sally and Larry married young. They had a tumultuous marriage filled with the ups and downs of most marriages. Sally felt she could never live up to Larry's demands. And no matter how hard she tried, she failed to fulfill his expectations. Larry, a former Marine, was a very matter-of-fact person. Everything for him was black and white. Do this, don't do that. Everything was regimented, and you don't dare deviate from his guidelines. Sally lived more in the gray, and always felt that Larry was displeased with her. Despite her efforts to please Larry, she always fell short of his heavy-handed approach. Sally desperately wanted Larry to love and accept her, but it seemed he was only pleased with her when she was doing what he wanted, and when she failed, he quickly removed his acceptance. Sally, who was raised in a very strict religious home, was not unaccustomed to this kind of paradigm. Her father, too, raised her to believe that if she did the right things, then she would be loved. If she failed, then she was forced to try to make amends. After 25 years of marriage, Larry was diagnosed with cancer and died shortly after. Not long after Larry's death, Sally met Glenn. Glenn was unlike any person Sally had ever been around. He seemed to accept Sally just the way she was. He seemed less concerned with changing her as he was with simply loving her and giving himself to her. 
His approval of her seemed less about what she did and more about his commitment and love for her. Sally, however, had a hard time accepting this kind of love from Glenn. She almost preferred Larry's ways because she didn't have to feel bad for his acceptance. She earned everything she got from Larry. Whereas with Glenn, she didn't have to strive or work that hard for his approval. In fact, he never criticized her or even had a harsh word for her. He just loved her. And unlike Larry, this love didn't seem connected to anything Sally did or didn't do. And this kind of bothered Sally. She remembered the times with Larry when she really nailed it. The sense of satisfaction was exhilarating. She never felt this with Glenn. It was almost as if her behavior was not that important to him. He just loved being around her. He would constantly tell her how beautiful she was, even in the morning before she had a chance to fix herself up. He must be lying, she thought. He can't really mean these things. Larry only told me I looked good when I actually did, and so I believed him. Despite years of marriage to Glenn, Sally continued to live under the demands of Larry. When Glenn would ask Sally why she felt the need to please someone who was dead, Sally would respond, He doesn't feel dead. I hear his voice in my head, and what he says makes sense. In fact, it makes more sense than what you say, because it gives me more control of the outcome. With you, the outcome is always the same. In fact, it seems you're the one in control. You don't seem to be phased by my behavior one bit. Glenn would lovingly pull Sally into his embrace and encourage her to trust his love, but it was very difficult for Sally. In fact, she would often visit Larry's grave and reminisce about their years together. Larry's impact upon Sally never left her, and despite the amazing marriage she had with Glenn, far better than anything she ever had with Larry, she still felt drawn to Larry. He felt very alive to her. His words of harsh condemnation were constantly reverberating in her ears. Try as she might to receive Glenn's words of comfort and grace, she had the hardest time allowing them to make any true impact upon her. She seemed to always gravitate toward Larry and the high expectations he placed upon her. She loved those insurmountable requirements he placed upon her. It gave her goals to shoot for. It made progress tangible and something she could easily see the results. With Glenn, it was almost as if progress goals and results were taken off the table. And this made understanding how to please him very difficult. What do I need to do? Nothing, he would respond, but she rarely believed him. The freedom Glenn gave to Sally was so foreign to her that it was scary. She didn't feel free. She felt bound to everything she'd always known. Everything in her life was built on this performance treadmill. And as much as she wanted to be set free from its power, she kept running back to it like an old comfortable shoe that despite its stench and tattered appearance, was easy and familiar. Glenn wasn't either of those things. He wasn't easy or familiar. His approach was completely foreign to her. He spoke words that no one else ever had, and this made Sally question whether any of what he said was really true. Where's the catch, she thought. She lived out her days married to Glenn, but simultaneously feeling pulled to the ever-present words of Larry that seemed to challenge everything Glenn ever had to say. This is the Christian experience. Simultaneously being accused by the law and set free by the gospel. When the old man, the old Adam and Eve, hears the law, he hears a prescription. Like a doctor giving you a prescription for how to get healthy. The old man hears God's commands as something to do. 
a prescription for a holy life, a prescription for earning God's blessings, a prescription for some kind of growth. When the new man in Christ hears the commands of God, he hears a description, a description of what Jesus has already done. This is not an either-or experience. This is a simultaneous experience that happens between our old and new man as they wage war in this thing that we call the Christian life. The new man in Christ sees only Christ, what He has done for you. The old man in yourself sees only you and what you need to do. This is the way of the world. Do more, try harder, get better. With enough effort and determination, what Aristotle called habituation, with enough of these things you can change. You can become what God has called you to be. This puts many of us on a treadmill of Christian activity, working really hard but going nowhere. What you find after years of running is that you haven't gotten anywhere and it leads many to give up on Christianity because it didn't deliver what they felt it had promised. The message of Christianity not only offends the world, it offends the church. Telling people to give up on themselves and put all of their hope in Jesus in His perfect life instead of your efforts at self-improvement is not really very popular. Telling people that it's about Christ's sacrificial death instead of your vain attempts at finding life is not very popular. The death and life of Jesus, when understood rightly, will always offend the sinner, including the sinner that resides in you. Only the new man rightly receives the message. The comfort of the cross is to clothe and wrap Christ in my sin, your sin, and the sin of the entire world. For if Christ bore all your sin in His body and crucified them on the cross, then they will never belong to you again. Instead, you are free from the accusation of the law and sin, and by His wounds you are healed. Now I want you to hear what I'm about to say to you this morning. I want you to hear Christ's words for you. As you think about all the ways you failed to love God above all else and love your neighbor as yourself, as you've been filled with worry and doubt about current world events, as you have sinned in both word and deed and even in thought, both in what you've done and what you've left undone, I have a word for you. On account of Christ's finished work, His shed blood given for you, I want you to hear the promise that all of your sin in their entirety has been forgiven. They've been separated from you as far as the east is from the West. And you can leave here this morning in peace. But it begs the question, what now? How do I move forward in my Christian life? How do I break these patterns of sinful behavior? That's the third thing I want us to notice. Is that as Christians... Our growth is not about our movement toward Jesus, but His movement toward us. Martin Luther said it like this, to progress is to begin again. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, You were washed, 
you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Sanctified. Past tense. Finished. Passive. Too often the Christian life is described as a person now indwelt by the Holy Spirit, getting better day by day. But the Bible describes the Christian life as a complicated, messy, spiritual war that is waged within as our new man in Christ is vanquishing the old man in ourselves who refuses to die but already has and one day will be done away with altogether. If you build your life, your church, your ministry, your family around some desire to progressively become more holy, you will not only fail to receive the gift that Jesus has already given you, that new car parked in the driveway, but you will do violence to yourself and to one another. In yourself, that is in your flesh, you are never ever holy. No matter how much you discipline yourself, you cannot achieve holiness any more than your dog can develop the ability to be human. In Christ, in His life given to you, you are never, ever sinful. No matter how much you sin and disobey, you cannot take away from the righteousness that is yours in Christ. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more than He already does. And there's nothing you can do to make Him love you less. You see, Jesus is your righteousness. Full stop. Therefore, you're free. You're free to quit worrying about your growth and your progress and to simply rest in what Christ has done for you. Sanctification is being salvationed. The new life arising from the catastrophe suffered by the old upon hearing the good news that Jesus alone saves. It is the flower that blossoms in the desert watered by the unconditional grace of God. Sanctification is simply the art of getting used to your justification. Sanctification cannot in any way be separated from justification. In fact, the scriptures rarely, if ever, treat sanctification as a movement distinct from justification. In writing to the Christians at Corinth, for instance, which is, if there's any church that we would say was not sanctified, it would be Corinth, right? But Paul writes to them, what does he say? Those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who are in every place, call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then later Paul says, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that whoever boasts should boast in the Lord. To the Thessalonians, Paul writes that they have been chosen by God from the beginning to, quote, be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. To the Hebrews, the writer says, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Speaking of Christ's death and our being put to death with Him, it is crucial to note here in Romans 7, that Paul does not tell his readers that they have to now get busy and die. See, we always want to find a way to put our foot in the door, right? So we hear, oh, I need to die? Okay, here's my opportunity. I'm going to get, I'm going to get my action in here. Paul doesn't tell his readers, though, get busy and die. Go do something for the Lord. He announces the startling and unconditional fact that we have already died. It is not a task to be accomplished, 
but a promise for which to cling. And in fact, an event in the past for which you are to remember. All who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death. So that out of that death may come newness of life, just like and as sure as the resurrection of Jesus Christ Himself. Sin is a slavery from which we escape only through death. This is why Jesus said, If you want to follow me, take up your cross. This is not a way to prove to God that you love Him or that you are some kind of super disciple. This is the way in which we receive the new life in Christ. It comes through death. Only one who, is, who has died is free from sin. There is no other way. The old self has been crucified so that the sinful body might also be destroyed and we might at last be free. Christ now becomes our life. As Paul says in Colossians, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. And you see, good theology is about distinctions. With sanctification, it is no different. We are simultaneously sinner to our very core and righteous in every way possible. We are continually falling and failing and stumbling along in this life, but at the same time, we have already arrived. We are running the race, but already victorious. We have the stench of death, but the fragrance of Christ. We are not progressively moving toward the goal, but the goal is steadily and tenaciously moving closer to us. The new man is none other than the Holy Spirit, who has taken up residence in you. And as you can imagine, you don't improve upon the Holy Spirit. You simply rest in His presence within you and watch Him work His grace in and through your life. The only thing that gets in the way of this is us, our sin, which is not something you just rid yourself of. It's something we die to by turning toward Christ. And so it's just over and over and over again, our baptism. In myself, in my flesh, all I can do is sin, and the only time I will quit sinning is when I'm fully dead. To live is Christ by faith, to die is gain in all of its fullness. In Galatians 5, Paul talks about the works of the flesh. What you do, they're works. But then he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit is what Jesus has done for you. Works are active. Fruit is passive. God is not in the transformation business, taking you from one place sinner to a better place saint. God is in the death and life business, putting you to death and giving you life in Christ. It might seem like semantics, but it's a very important distinction because the one puts you on the road to recovery. The one puts you somehow in the driver's seat with God as your helper. The other puts Christ as the one that's driving the bus. And everything that happens to you he has already accomplished. This is the Christian experience. An ongoing war that you are simultaneously fighting and already victorious over. As Paul says in the next chapter, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And as Paul sums up our passage this morning, when he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? A cry of desperation. And he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ 
our Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for these truths, the promise that in you we have everything that we need, that you've given us everything we need for a life of godliness, that it's not about our efforts, our progress, or our hard work, that Jesus, it's about what you've done for us. May that truth absolutely revolutionize our life. May we walk in the freedom that we have in Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen.